It's a taboo that's been placed upon us since we're children. You don't kill animals, you don't kill anything. You do not kill what I have. It's difficult to kill when there's no provocation because you feel like you're not a good person. You feel like you betrayed something. born in Arroyo, Puerto Rico. I have uh, four brothers and one sister. I'm the middle child. I'm uh, number three. I don't remember a lot about growing up in Puerto Rico. What I do remember is that there was a lot of sun and there was a lot of beaches and I remember, I remember being outside a lot. I remember being in the woods a lot. I enjoy being in the woods and I remember taking, uh, taking walks into the forests uh, in the mountains of Puerto Rico with my brothers and my friends from the neighborhood exploring. And that was, that was fun, just looking for new places to see within the woods and hanging out on trees and things like that. I remember that. That was, that was a lot of fun. I went to uh, Sewer Park High School. That's in the Lower East Side. So I played handball. I was the number one in handball. I also did fencing and I did uh, basketball. Pretty much anything that I could just to get away and just participate and do something other than just hang out on the streets. Uh, pretty much stay out of trouble. It was winter and we were standing in the front of a class and I saw these kids looking at me and talking about me but I couldn't tell what they were saying. So I turned around and I asked this girl, what, what are they saying? And she looked at me and she said, oh, they are, they're talking about taking your jacket. And I got scared right away because I don't want them taking my jacket. Right? It's the only jacket I have. <laughs> so I, uh, I didn't know what to do. So I, I kind of walked up to them. I picked up a chair and I hit one. And pretty much they left me alone. I think that that was the first time I noticed that if you exert confidence and authority, that pretty much people leave you alone. I always wanted to be a writer. But it's a funny thing about writing. I always thought that it was a little effeminate. So, <laughs> so I, I thought it was not as tough as with the neighborhood that I grew up. So I always put it aside. I always did a little here and a little there, kind of like hiding under the table, kind of like, all right, I'll write a poem, but I won't tell anybody. <laughs> or I'll write a story, but nobody will ever see it again, you know, that sort of thing. And then when I got to high school, we were supposed to, actually turn in the assignments and the teachers noticed right away that I've been writing for a while. And that's when I thought, well, maybe, maybe I'll just write. I, I actually went into the Marine Corps with the idea that I was going to be a journalist. <laughs> I actually didn't do much. I contemplated my going away. I had a big afro back in the day. And <laughs> I kept thinking, I had a big Angela Davis afro. I get thinking, this is all gonna be gone. Tomorrow I'm going to be a Marine. Mom, I've woken up and cooked some breakfast, but I didn't eat, and she said goodbye, and then my brothers got up, and we hugged each other to say goodbye. And everybody was crying, I had a lump in their throat, and told me to take care, and, and I left. Walking into a shooting range, for me, was a revelation. I never shot a rifle in my life. Never had a weapon. Uh, we never had access to weapons when we were kids. We never hunted or anything like that. When they gave me my rifle, it was an M16. And when they gave it to me, I don't know, I just felt it and I knew. I don't know, I knew that I would shoot this weapon. Uh, no training, and then when they, we, we trained for several positions, shooting positions, and the first position that we 
happened to grab was the uh, kneeling position. When I went into the kneeling position and we had the sling, we used to wrap around the sling around the arm and then from the arm it tightens against the rifle. So it's pretty much tight, but when you take the stock and you put it against your shoulder, it's like a locked three-point position. When I put it against my shoulder and I held it like this, I knew. I knew in my heart, nobody was going to be better than me. I knew in my heart that I was going to shoot like no one's business. I knew, and sure enough, the first time I shot, I shot expert. And they thought I was cheating because my score was so high. And then they tested me again, and I shot again. I almost broke the range record. I think it was like 258 at the time or something. And uh, they're thinking this kid is cheating because he's shooting so high, and there's nothing in his background that says that he could shoot. But... Uh, First time in my range, in the range, and I saw that target. We started at, I think, 200 yards, and then we went to the 300 and 500. Even for the 500 yards, I could just look at the target and know I could hit that guy. <laughs> I was in Camp Lejeune. Camp Lejeune was my base camp, and I pretty much stayed there most times. But I was in Camp Lejeune and Grenada was just about to explode. And the Colonel called me and told me that I was going to down to Grenada, Honduras and Nicaragua area. So he said, you'll go to, Hondu uh, you'll go to Nicaragua and you'll do a little bit of training for these people, uh, meaning the Contras. And I went and the Colonel there gave me a grid. I got there two o'clock in the afternoon maybe. By 10 o'clock, he had told me be out in the woods. I have no idea what the woods look like or anything. He just gave me a map, gave me my compass. I went to the armory, checked out the rifle and I was on my way for the night. I was there maybe a day or two into the woods, just trolling my perimeter. And that's when the first contact came about. Uh, it was a, was a kill zone, pretty much what you expect sniper to do. If you put them in an area and then this grid is yours and whatever moves, no one is supposed to be there, whatever moves you shoot. Right. I was with the eight sniper. Eight snipers are most times the senior sniper. They're just like, they're the one that pop you up and tell you, well, this 900, 900 yards, usually you don't shoot that far. You usually shoot like 700, 800 yards at the most, 500 yards if you can. That's ideal. But that's the, and he uh, he was tall. I was my I was my shot. Snipers trained to take that one shot. Most most snipers cannot take that shot. It's not easy to take that shot. It's not. It's just not. It's just not normal thing for a man to do. Uh, most people shoot back. If you're shooting at them, well, they're gonna shoot you back. But it's hard to tell someone here take this weapon, go to the subway and shoot the first person you shoot. See, come back tomorrow. I'll sh give you the same weapon and you go shoot somebody else. Most people won't do it. There's some little crazies that will, but, <laughs> but most people won't do it. It's not something normal to do. So it's very, very stressful. It's just murder. It's just truly, you, can't, you, got, you just got to shoot somebody with men doing nothing for you, at your, to you. So it's very difficult. So you start sweating everything that's the moment that you see because you I don't want to quit, I want to punk out, but also it's a big step in your life. You have to make sure that this is what you want because once you do it, you got to live with this for the rest of your life.
and he ranged it and he said yeah 660 and he said send it that's the code to that's a fire away he said send it you, you shoot and my <laughs> I had the guy I had I had him dead and they said send it there wasn't that even that second not even not even one second of hesitation I send it and after I send it after I shot I thought about it I shot and as soon as he shoots maybe a second later you see the guy drop and I shot and then you kind of like go down stay there for a second waiting for reactions and then you look for your avenues of retreat and if you need to verify the kill more you could just go down there and look wait for somebody to come looking at the dead person and then you shoot them and then somebody else comes looking at the dead people and say what the hell happened here and you shoot them and eventually you have a little pile going on but that's usually what you do but uh, I send it and <laughs> that's all I could think of. I send it. I send it. How could I send it? I just send it. And it wouldn't get out of my head. I kept thinking, I just send it. And I was with a gunnery sergeant and he kept saying, All right, kid, just just stay calm. And I said, I'm calm. He said, you look calm, but stay calm. Get it out of your head. This is your job. That's it. It's your job. And I kept thinking, It's my job. And he said, You just saved 10 Marines. I said, yes, I did say 10 rings. You have to justify yourself. And the way to justify it is one way. It's like for everyone that you shoot, 10 rings are saved. And I just say 10 rings. Most times you wait, you could wait days, but usually you don't wait that long. Usually you wait, you could wait a day or two. You could be a on the scope a couple of hours at a time get off the scope be back again in the scope another couple of hours can't stay on the scope for that long can't go to sleep because if your targets are being <laughs> so you can't go to sleep you do with very very little sleep and you still gotta make your shot snapping is not easy it's not like in the movies where you can just sit there all calm and collected and make a shot by the time you take a shot you dehydrated, you have no energy, uh, adrenaline starts pumping at the moment of the shot, but before then, your pulse is all erratic, so your weapon is all turning, your vision might be blurry, so you got to compensate for that. It's not an old rosy shot, you can't take a shot like, just after a shower. <laughs> I think it's not easy. It's not as for a young man, and it's not it's not easy. And then you have to shut your alarms off. They're telling you don't take that shot. Go ahead and retreat and say you didn't have a shot. But you gotta you know, somebody needs this person out, so you gotta take it out because it's not for you to say yes or no. This is this is it. You just have to do it. And it's not easy, but. so easy for you to fall back and take pity on yourself and say look at me how far away I am and you feel like you're a million miles away from home you feel like you're so far away and most times I was alone most times it was just one more person most times that person is just already dead and you're looking all at yourself and you're bloody to hell and you're thinking it would be so easy to just to sit down. I could just sit down here and it would be so easy. Just let them come and maybe put me in a cot, maybe put a bullet through my chest and that was that. It would be so easy. If you don't let despair grab you, you get out pretty much out of anywhere. You're one man. If you're one man, I don't care how many people are looking for you. You could evade them if you keep your head together. I've had people stand right next to me 
while I'm camouflaged and take a pee on me thinking I'm a bush. If you stay calm and let the pee roll off your back, they will move away. If you lose it, they will grab you. But staying calm and staying cool is probably the best weapon a sniper has. You gotta stay calm. You gotta think things through. I don't think about death so much. I'm not obsessed by death. I know that death was my business back in the day. I have to tell you, I was a different kind of man back then. I, was, <laughs> I wasn't the same as I am now. I rarely spoke. I rarely laughed. I have very few friends. And all I thought about was the missions. All I thought about was the shooting. Now I can think of other things. But back in the day, it was different. But I still think about death the same way. I, don't, I wasn't afraid of dying then. I'm not afraid of dying now. It's not, I'm not particularly courageous. I'm not, I think people that have a lot of courage are people that are afraid and they still do the things that they do. Me, I, was, uh, I really wasn't afraid all that much. I, w I, w I was rarely afraid. Once in a while, I would get a little nervous, but I was rarely afraid. That's not courage. That's, that's some sort of imbalance. <laughs> it's not really courage. Courageous people are the people that, you know, that they get scared, and they still do the things they do because they go beyond their fear. Me, I, I, wasn't really, I wasn't really afraid. I wasn't, once in a while, you get to think, whoa, I might die here. But still, I wasn't afraid. Uh, when the thoughts of death came, I thought about them more as a comfort. I kept thinking, well, it would be nice if it ended. I, I was getting a little warped, and it wasn't, it wasn't good. So it would have been, if I had ended then, I think it would have been a nice ending. Wouldn't, I'm glad I'm here now and I've done the things I've done after then. But I consider this like a gravy train type of thing. I, like a second life, it's not really, I did what I did and it seemed fine at the time. And if I had ended then, it would have been fine as well. I don't think I would have shed any tears. That's not good. It's a taboo that's been placed upon us since we're children. You don't kill animals, you don't kill anything. You do not kill. What I have, and most people ask you, how does it feel to kill? And what's a job? And not that I justify justifies the killing, but it just, you feel compelled to do what's going to save other people. I can guarantee you that if someone were to uh, come and threaten my family, I would have not even, I, it wouldn't even occur to me to think about ending their lives. Uh, it, would co it would cost me nothing to end their lives. I don't think about killing anyone for the sake of killing them. But if that were to happen, I think anybody would do it. It's difficult to kill when there's no provocation because you feel like you're not a good person. You feel like you're betraying something. One time someone asked me, how did it feel the first time I pulled that, sent that round down? And it felt more like A betrayal. Like when you cheated on somebody that loves you so much, your husband or wife, and you just cheated on them. And you're so ashamed that you did it, and you'll never do it again. But the betrayal is there, and you just feel like it's tearing you apart. And that's how it felt. It felt like I betrayed something, or I betrayed somebody. Like all the other cheaters, you go back and do it again. I have a terrific, uh, a terrific defense mechanism where I forget everything. I forget 
everything that happens to me. I forget what I've been. I forget the places that I've seen. I forget the people that I've met. I forget everything. And I know that sometimes you see it on TV or, you know, they go, oh, I remember every face of the men that I killed. I don't remember anybody. I don't remember the faces, the names. I don't remember. I remember some of the shots I took. But that's mainly pride. I don't remember anything. And it's a horrible thing to say. But that's probably why they selected me. Uh, it's not, it's just a psychological makeup. There's something wrong with me? Maybe, maybe not, but it doesn't really matter. I did what I did and that is that. I don't think God cares. I really don't. If I were God, I wouldn't care. Just little people over there to me. <laughs> I think God, I think God got his own problems to care what I've done. And if he does notice what I've done, I don't see a way that he could forgive me. I really don't. I really don't think he'll. I mean, if he's like the way they say, they say he is, he won't forgive me. He will just send me a little way to hell, and I'll get a managerial job over there, and I'll be fine. It seems like I get regretful. But it's easier for me, I, I, I sound like a pathological assassin of some sort. Uh, it seems like it's easy for me to put it out of my head. I can feel it bothering me, but it's easy for me to get out, get it out of my head where it won't bother me. And it's easy for me just to put it aside. Although I have, I did get out. I stopped being a sniper before I got out of the Marine Corps. I, I, I could not do it anymore. I was turning into somebody that I could, I, I really, I, I, I was losing my soul. I kept, I kept thinking, this is not a good place to be. I wasn't, it was, to me it was horrible. I was a different man, but it was horrible. It was more like, Sergeant Rodriguez, we got another mission. All right. You want to know where it is? I don't care. How many people this time? It doesn't really matter. I've come out of the woods bathed in blood and not think of it. That's not normal. That's not normal that, that you would do that. I've waken up with some man's body next to me with a, my knife in his chest and I couldn't remember doing it. He might have come up to me when I was asleep and I did it in my sleep and I went right back to sleep. That's not normal. Normal human beings don't act that way. I had to get out. I, I couldn't continue that way. I kept thinking that I was I kept thinking that it was bad. So I guess I regret it. I felt remorse then because otherwise I would not have gotten out. Strange. It's strange being a father of two kids. I, it's definitely something odd about the way I feel. It made me, that's why I was a sniper, but I don't feel things the way that other people feel. They're not, they don't register the same way I know because Everybody glorifies fatherhood and things like that. I, I love my kids to death for sure. I do. It's just strange that they would just give them to me and they just say, it's yours. You just feel strange that there's no one supervising me because I'm a, I'm a nut. I mean, like, they shouldn't be giving me children, but they're turning out terrific and <laughs> it just feels strange. <laughs> I guess my last words were, those were, right or wrong, those were my days of glory. Right or wrong, I was on top of the world. Thank you.